Hi! Happy Sunday, everyone! Happy Forgiveness Day! I hope you guys are all having a great afternoon so far. So, normally I do lives typically on Monday, but I wanted to chime in today and just do a little something since today historically is a special day. And I, uh, hey Revol, how are you? Happy Forgiveness Day, as I'm calling it. <laughs> so, uh, people may be like, why, Beth, are you calling it Forgiveness Day? Everyone's, you know, going around uh, wishing everyone Happy Easter. So, yesterday I was driving, and uh, some of my best thinking <laughs> I do when I am in my car moving along. And so, I was like, why do they call it Easter? I've never really heard Easter mentioned in the Bible. I've heard Passover, never heard Easter. So, hey. So I was thinking about it, and when I got to where I was going, I decided to look up the history of the word Easter. And when I looked it up, I thought, oh, okay. Um, so actually, Easter was technically um, a goddess. I'm lo I looked it up. Her name was, I think, Ost Ostra? O-S-T-R-E. Um, so she was like a English goddess. Hey! And I started thinking about that and I thought, okay, so if I'm going to be celebrating um, Jesus' life and his choosing to die so that I could be forgiven, why am I also celebrating some pagan goddess? <laughs> so that is why I have just started calling it, as of yesterday, Forgiveness Day. Um, so yes, I mean, it's not a movement that I'm trying to start or anything, but it was just something that I was thinking about. And I do like to, I, I find, especially in the past couple of years, I do like to do my own research and figure out, you know, why things are called a certain name, you know, where, where's the history behind it. Um, but before I even go into anything else, I did want to talk a little bit about forgiveness because, you know, um, if you have been following me for a, the past few months, uh, you know, but if you're new, you might not be aware. So I've been doing a lot of work towards helping people learn how to forgive, going through the process of forgiveness, because forgiveness is something we're taught that we should do, but we don't always know how to do it. So before I do anything else, I just wanted to like share my thoughts on, you know, why it is uh, important for us, you know, like what's the big deal with forgiveness? Um, a lot of people just say like forgive and forget or just kind of shove things that have hurt them or even things that they've done to other people and maybe they feel guilty about just shoved it away. But really actually forgiveness in itself is a huge important gift. Um, I know for me, right, it's been the most important gift I could give myself. It's also the most important gift anyone can give themselves. So, or give to others, or that can be given to you, right? So, um, forgiveness usually is in like three different forms. It can either God to us, uh, us to ourselves, so self-forgiveness, or us to others, forgiving um, someone else who's hurt us, or from others to us. So actually that's four. <laughs> when, you know, we've hurt someone and they choose to forgive us. So what are some things that, you know, you can do to benefit from forgiveness? Because forgiveness is really a lifestyle. Uh, I actually did back in February a journal 20 day forgiveness journal challenge. And one of the people who had participated in the challenge referred to it as a lifestyle. And I was like, yes, she's right. Forgiveness is really kind of a lifestyle. So how does forgiveness help us? Well, for one, hey, natural intake. For one, forgiveness can free us from the fear of getting caught. <laughs> so when we admit that we messed up and did a mistake, we no longer have that, that shadow or that fear hanging over us that, uh-oh, I did X, Y, or Z. Now I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, what's going to happen? So think about, for example, like the kid in the cookie jar, right? 
So the mom, she's baking chocolate chip cookies. The kid sneaks into the kitchen when the mom's got her back turned, steals a couple cookies, right? And like just goes off. <laughs> so the mom's like, wait, where did my cookies go when she turns around? And she's like, hey, what happened? And the child's like, it wasn't me. I don't know what you're talking about, mom. Cookies? And the mom's like, it's just you and me in the house right now. And you, <laughs> uh, did you come into the kitchen? Uh, you have to know that cookies were baking because the smell, the chocolate chip cookie smell is going everywhere in the house, right? And the kid's like, uh-oh, I got caught. Now what's going to happen, right? So like the first instinct a lot of times is to like hide and say it wasn't me or to even try to blame it on someone else because uh, we don't want to get caught, right? So, you know, we're now in trouble and the kid might be in trouble with their mom, right? Be like, uh-oh, now maybe mom's not going to ever let me have any more cookies from this batch. Maybe I've just like messed up my cookie, <laughs> my cookie treats for the rest of the week. Um, but whatever it is, right? When, when we kind of, when we make a mistake and we hide from it and we don't ask the other person who we hurt or God who we hurt, when we don't ask them and say, oops, you know, I accidentally did this and that, I just couldn't help it. Hey, right, the cookie smelled so good, I, I just couldn't resist, right? But now, you know, that fear from getting caught, right? But when we are able to say, okay, you know, I was, I was wrong, I took the cookie, um, you know, I know you weren't done baking the cookies, things weren't really ready yet to eat, mom, I apologize. Then we don't have that fear, we don't have that worry. Um, so that's one thing, it can release us. That was just like a really superficial example, of course, you know, this could be much bigger. But, you know, basically when we, if we make a mistake and we ask someone else to forgive us for that mistake, we leave behind that fear of getting caught. So we're just able to now live comfortably. Also forgiveness, it gives us control in a situation. It gives us the ability to take our power back. So. For example, say someone hurt you, you're going around her and now you're saying my life, you know, had X, Y, and Z all happen because this person stole money from me or this person cheated on me or this person, um, whatever it is that they happen to do, uh, when we're saying, oh, now my life is messed up because this person did this to me, it's true, of course, this person, if they cheated on you, you know, probably broke your heart broke your trust maybe in uh, the ability to trust in future relationships, maybe they stole money from you, now your, your, your checkbook's all you know messed up, whatever it is. But then we're giving that person, hello, that person control, the ability to control our future. Yes, they uh, you know messed up our present, but when we continue to like hold the grudge against someone else, long term for like weeks, months, years even, uh, all of a sudden now that person has all the control, all the power in our life. Hey. So that means that we don't have the control anymore. We've given our power, our ability to trust others, our ability to heal, our ability to be able to move forward and, and live the life that we desire to live. Um, we've given it to someone else. They're holding us back. But when we release them, when we're like, yep, you hurt me, it was wrong, but I forgive you, we've now taken our control and our power back. It gives us power in that situation. It gives us power and control in our life. So that's another reason why forgiveness isn't so important. Also, kind of similar to this, when we forgive others, when we're not forgiving, we're always like kind of worried about being hurt again. This person hurt me, so maybe the next person will hurt me. Like it could be a hurt in business, it could be a hurt at church, it could be a hurt um, in a relationship, it could be a hurt from a parent, right? Hey, boo, hi, Shanaideen. So when we are not um, able to you know, forgive, it does kind of keep us and it holds us back from being able to trust and move forward in new relationships, whether it's a new, you know, romantic partnership, whether it's a new business relationship, whether it's within our own families with a brother or a sister or a cousin or whoever it is, right? We now, when we release someone and we are working on the healing, it makes us, it opens us up to being able to connect with new people without having in the back of my head, 
okay, I know that, you know, the last guy that I dated was an awful person. He beat me up. He did this. He did that. But if I'm able to forgive, then once I do, the next person that comes into my life, of course, obviously, I'm going to use wisdom, right? You're going to use wisdom. You're going to, uh, you know, kind of check them out, watch their behavior, ask them certain questions to kind of find out about their character. But at the same time, you're going to be able to do it from a more open, healed perspective. And therefore, you're going to be able to love other people more completely. And you're going to also be open to being able to receive love uh, more completely because you're healing and you're releasing those grudges or whatever, um, you know, we've been holding on to. The other reason that I wanted to talk about why a lifestyle of forgiveness is so important is that when we actually forgive about other people, when we forgive other people, we actually learn more about ourselves, right? I don't know how strong I am. I don't know how, how uh, flexible I am. I, there's so many things I don't know about myself until I'm able to kind of uh, transition and learn how to forgive someone else. In forgiving someone else, I learn more about my own power. I learn more about, you know, my ability to love. I learn more about my ability to trust. I learn so much more about myself when I'm actually forgiving someone else, right? So it's actually a learning process. And, you know, similar to like number, the second reason of getting control and power back in your life, when you're taking back control of your life, you're really learning about yourself. You're thinking like, okay, so, you know, this past relationship didn't work out. What is it that I want for my new relationship? How do I want my new relationships to look? Um, so you're starting to learn and redefine, you know, who you are and what it is that you're looking for in your life, what it is that you want for yourself. So it's really a learning process versus when we are unforgiving and we're just going around being angry and giving our power away. We're not really learning about how strong we are. We're not really learning about, you know, what we want. We're not planning for our futures. We're not learning how, you know, we want our next relationships or our next projects to go. So forgiveness really just pretty much opens up our life on so many levels. And so, you know, I started this um, live off by saying happy forgiveness day. So today, a lot of people, you know, are celebrating who are Christian around the world are celebrating the fact that, hey, Marcus, are celebrating the fact that, you know, on this, not particularly this exact day, <laughs> but uh, around this season, around this time of year, um, years ago, there is a man, Jesus, who said he was the son of God, who died on a cross, he resurrected, and by doing that, Christians around the world celebrate his doing that as their forgiveness from God. So I did actually want to talk to um, a, a little bit about this because I feel like a lot of people who are not necessarily Christian but are like curious about it uh, sometimes feel offended and they're like, well, you know, I'm a good person. You know, why would Jesus, why would God require me to believe in Jesus that he died for my sins, that he died for when I make mistakes, right? That only if I believe in, in Jesus will I get to go to heaven, will I have a, uh, a safe eternal life. So people may find this really offensive, and that's okay, and I get it. But the thing is, is that um, with God, he is perfect, right? And that means he's holy. And so even though we may be good people, uh, that doesn't make us perfect. <laughs> so I was thinking about this the other day and I was like, how do I get people to kind of understand that it's not like, um, oh, thanks, have a great day as well, city hybrid. Uh, talk to you later. I, there, You can rewatch too if you wanna catch the rest of it. Have a good one. So. People may be offended and be like, but I'm a good person. Why can't I go to a good place, right? I deserve a good place because I've been a good person. I didn't cheat on my spouse. I, you know, volunteered in my community. I gave money to homeless people. You know, I did all sorts of different things. Like I was a teacher. I did this. I did that. Like all these good things, right? But not perfect. So I was thinking about how to explain this to people. <laughs> and so I thought of my favorite animal, dogs. 
well, actually, technically, my favorite animal is a wolf. My second favorite is dogs. But dogs is what most people are going to relate to. So think about and pretend you are a dog owner, all right? Also, it's spring. So, you know, a lot of times in spring, people do house cleaning, right? They mop the floor. They, you know, clean things out. They basically get their house in order for the coming season. You know, it's all spruced up. Everything's shiny. The windows are polished. Furniture dusted. Everything's put away. Um, couch, right? The pillows are fluffed up. Um, it's looking good, right? So you have a dog and you just decide to let your dog out because your dog, you're like, you know what? You deserve to go run around in the backyard. It's time for you to go out. So you let the dog out in the backyard, go about your business, an hour later, you let the dog back in the house and you forgot that the night before it had rained and uh, the backyard actually is muddy. And so you let your dog in and, and then as the dog's coming in, you're like, oh my gosh, the dog has rolled in a mud puddle in the back of my yard. And you know what dogs do? They shake themselves off, right? When they get someplace that's like clean and dry. So now all over your mopped floor, all over everything, your dog's just shaking himself off and... Uh, he's made a mess of your nice area that you've perfectly cleaned. And then he looks in, he sees someone sitting in the living room, like your husband or your wife or your child, his other favorite person. And he's like, Ooh, my favorite person. And he starts to run towards the living room to greet them. And you're like, no. And you say to the dog, no, stop. But the dog just keeps going, right? Uh, he's not listening to you. He does not listen to the no because he's just a dog and he's being excited. So he jumps up on the couch, gets his paws all over with the mud, everything all over your new couch, right? So at your newly clean couch. So everything that you had just put in order in your house that was perfect um, is now a mess. And that's pretty much how um, I was thinking about trying to compare it with God, right? So he has his perfect place for him, right? It's perfect. It's got, if you read it, you know, it has gold streets. It's, you know, like shiny, polished. Now imagine, you know, you show up and you're kind of like the dog. And I'm not saying people are dogs. That's not what I'm saying. But you kind of, you know, you've got your mistakes that you've made. And now you're up in his house and you don't mean to, just kind of like the dog didn't mean to, you don't want to, but you've just kind of gotten things a little bit dirty. It doesn't mean that you're not a good person. It doesn't mean you're not loved. It just means that you're not perfect. Perfect and good are not quite the same. So um, God's basically, what would be the first thing once you got a hold of your dog that you would do? You would take your, your muddy dog, once you got a hold of him, you'd take him by the collar and you'd put him right back outside. You'd be like, no, not in my house. You're not messing my house up. And that's pretty much what God is like. He's like, you know, I've got it nice up in here. You know, people are praising me. People are worshiping me. It's beautiful. I've got everything cleaned up. And, you know, you're a good person, but uh, you're going to mess things up because you just mess up. And, it, and it's just like the dog. So we take the dog out. What are we going to do? We're just going to leave the dog out there? No, not a good dog owner, right? A good dog owner is going to go out and the dog owner is going to get the garden hose and grab some soap, some dog shampoo, and they're going to scrub the dog up. They're going to clean the dog up, right? The dog cannot clean himself up. He's a mess. Just like um, as people, we are, you know what? We can be a mess. I'll be honest. I can be a mess sometimes. Anyone who knows me knows that I make mistakes, right? Um, anyone who knows me will tell you that, that I am not perfect. So, um, you're, so just like you are going to go out and you're going to scrub the dog up, you're going to wash him down, you're going to soap him up, and you're going to scratch his ears. You're not going to be yelling at the dog, right? It's not like God is up in heaven with like a big stick waiting to smack us all down, right? He is, that's what he did when he sent Jesus to the earth to disciple people, to teach people about what heaven is like, what God is like, right? Um, to give them like, you know, a firsthand experience, right? Um, he wasn't expecting us who were like a mess to necessarily to just clean ourselves up. That, that was Jesus. He was here. He taught us. Um, he showed his disciples, you know, different strategies for how, you know, he told a lot of parables, right? He told um, his 
disciples, you know, you can cast out demons, you can, you know, make sure you take care of the poor, um, be good to the children, right? There were certain, there were many, many things he taught. So then when it came time towards the end of his life, what he did when he died on the cross, that was, now a lot of religions actually, um, it, it was by the shedding of his blood, his blood. A lot of times you will see, and it sounds kind of gory and people are like, the blood, that's creepy. But a lot of religions over the course of history have had that as, you know, a blood sacrifice being required to please, you know, the God of the harvest or the God of the weather, you know, different religions, you know, a lot of times did human sacrifices. Um, a lot of religions uh, would do uh, not, sometimes they would be like sacrificing virgins, young women, sometimes they would be sacrificing a baby. Um, different, you know, different religions over the course of history have required humans to be sacrificed. But God was like, I love, I love you. I'm not looking for you to sacrifice your own people. Um, in the Jewish religion prior, what they were doing was they were sacrificing a lamb or a dove or, you know, an animal that was innocent, right? And so that, that, that sacrifice, that blood was what would cover that person who gave that sacrifice to, um, to the altar, to the priest. Um, so, but Jesus was like, you know what, this is, God's plan was, you know, he was here because God's plan was not quite going right. People were still messing up. Things were, if you read the Old Testament, it, it got a little, <laughs> people were having a hard time. Um, we know as Christians, the Ten Commandments, I forget how many commandments there were um, for Jewish believers. They could tell you. It's a lot. It's in, it's in the hundreds, right? It's hard to remember how to do all of these things. Hey, really, Jay Blessed? Um, so it's hard to do all these things. And so, you know, it, you know, you can't remember, like, you have to wash your hands this way. You have to do, you have to do all sorts of things, right? It's hard work. So Jesus came and he was like, you know what? I'm going to make this easier for people. So I'm going to be the one sacrifice. All people have to do is, you know, believe in me, trust in me, and that will grant them eternal life. So really that's God kind of like, you know, when you, as a dog owner, cleaning up your dirty dog, right? You're doing all the work. The dog's not having to do anything. That's pretty much what God is. He's doing all the work for us. He just requires us to believe in him, to trust, you know, Jesus, to be thankful and to say, I'm sorry, I've messed up. I have made some mistakes um, and whatever it is. And the thing is, is I think a lot of times people are like, okay, well, that sounds great. But if I admit and I say to um, you know, God, I, I did this, I did that, I'm sorry, I repent. Well, maybe I'm going to be in big trouble. But the thing is, if you think about it, God is waiting for us to just say, I'm sorry. It's not something that he's like, oh, you said you're sorry. You admitted that you had that abortion or, or you admitted you cheated on your math test when you were in sixth grade or you admitted that your accounting practices for your taxes aren't quite right. Oh, you're admitting these things. Now I'm going to like beat you up and I'm going to punish you. Well, that's not really his way. So obviously there's always consequences. Say you cheat on your spouse. The consequence might be your partner leaves you and says goodbye, right? So it's not like, there's no consequences for when we when we choose to do the wrong thing. But at the same time, if you if you read in Luke, there were there was this thief that also uh, was crucified uh, alongside Jesus for having stole. <laughs> and so they were both hanging out on this cross, like literally hanging out right in pain and everything. And the thief, one of the thieves, there were two. But one of the thieves in Luke says please remember me, you know, like I'm guilty. I really did. I really did steal things. Um, but Hey Josh, I, I really did do things wrong, right? I really did mess up. Uh, I stole things, but please remember me in paradise. And Jesus isn't like, Oh my goodness. I can't believe you stole all these, that all that money from those innocent people. You are such a terrible, awful person. No, he didn't give him the riot act. He was like, I will remember you. You will be in paradise with me today. It, that, that was it. So it was like a confession. Um, please remember, uh, like, oops, you know, I was a thief. I am, I deserve to be here. I would, you know, I deserve this punishment because I was wrong, but please remember me. And Jesus said he will remember me. 
there's something that stood out to me also. I was reading earlier this week in Genesis. So uh, there is, this is something that I don't often, in fact, I don't remember ever hearing anyone ever talk about it. Um, Thank you, Josh. So in Genesis, there is, you know, the issue with Adam and Eve. And Eve ate a pomegranate. I think it's called an apple usually, but it's people suspect that it was a pomegranate historians. Hello. Uh, so anyway, the first thing that happened when um, they got caught by God was uh, <laughs> Adam was like, uh, I ate because the woman made me do it. <laughs> so the first thing was for Adam to blame his wife. But when everything got situated and God was like, you know what? My garden was perfect. I made the perfect place. I wanted you to enjoy this perfect place. Um, But you messed up. You ruined it. You didn't listen to me. You listened to my enemy. You listened to Satan who said it was okay. So you messed up. So you can no longer live in this perfect place because you ruined it. But here's the thing that I've never really heard anyone talk about. Before he has them leave the garden... It says God sewed clothes or God made clothes for Adam and Eve. So even though they messed up, even though they clearly did wrong because instead of listening to what he had asked them to do, um, which was stay away from the tree of good and evil, they chose to listen to a snake, to Satan, right? They chose to listen to someone else um, besides their creator. So they messed up. But even in their mess up, God took care of them. He literally made them close. So what does that tell you um, is going to happen? It's, it's not, what I'm trying to get at is asking God for forgiveness, telling God, I repent, I'm sorry, I've, I've done whatever it is that you've done in your life that's like on your heart, that's weighing down on your mind, that's like holding you back, that's, that you're afraid of um, getting out into the open, Right? Don't be afraid because look at how God has treated other people in in the stories that you read when they do repent, right? There's all sorts of stories all through throughout the Bible where these people do major, major mess ups and he still takes care of them. He accepts the apology and still takes care of them. So I, I, I think that... Um, you know, sometimes people have been afraid to say, forgive me, God, please forgive me. I'm sorry, because they're afraid and there will be consequences, right? Like Adam and Eve did get kicked out of Garden of Eden, but God took care of them. He made them close before he sent them out and then he was still with them. And the other thing that I just wanted to touch on today briefly was a lot of times people um, will think, but that's like so narrow. Why is it that to get to heaven, I have to believe in Jesus and I have to ask God to forgive me for my sins. Like, why is that such a big deal? That's kind of narrow minded. Like if I'm a good person and we already talked about a little bit, the difference between good and, and bad, um, or sorry, not good and bad, good and perfect. Right. Um, you know what, before I get on that, there was something else that I wanted to talk about. Um, a lot of times why we hide our mistakes, This was something that I had in my notes and I just realized I skipped over. A lot of times we are afraid to uh, admit our mistakes. We're afraid to say we're wrong, not only because of the fear of the punishment, but because our identity is broken. So think about like we are trained from when we are very young, kindergarten, maybe preschool. I have no idea. I never went to preschool. We are trained to think a certain way. So imagine you and, and think back to like a time when you were in first grade or second grade, you took a spelling test and you got a 100. And what do you get? One of those little scratch and sniff stickers. I loved the great flavored ones, right? So I get a scratch and sniff sticker next to the 100, a good job. Maybe I get a reward. I get a pencil or I get an eraser, you know, like some little treat. Um, the next week I get a spelling test back <laughs> and I got like a 60 on it. Now all of a sudden, Um, there's no good job, there's a punishment, and I feel ashamed. I don't want anyone to see that I made all these mistakes. And it is from like a very, very young age where we're taught like if you do good, be publicly celebrated, and if you mess up and you're not, you know, perfect, so to speak, and no human is perfect, to hide it, to be ashamed of it. 
So a lot of times our identity, even from uh, when we are children, is kind of warped so that when we get older and we get into our teenage years or our 20s or 30s, even like 80s or 90s, right? We're thinking like, if I mess up, I have to hide it. I should be embarrassed. Um, and obviously some of our mistakes are can be really ugly to look at and it's not like you know i'm not saying you know definitely you don't necessarily want to put it out on social media or whatever but just to admit it and and say to god you know i i i cheated i did this i did that whatever it is um you know that's that's freeing and so also we have to understand who our identity is like it's okay that we're not perfect we do make mistakes you know we learn from them so moving on, you know, growing and moving forward. So I did forget to mention, you know, like a lot of times, you know, the way we treat God or the way we treat others or the way we even for, uh, treat ourselves in, you know, being able to accept um, forgiveness from someone else, being able to ask for forgiveness is because our identity is so broken, starting from literally when we were children. When we were children, actually from like birth to age seven, Pretty much what all people are doing is all children are just like absorbing. Um, they're just taking in information after information after information and they're just kind of absorbing it and, you know, quietly processing it. And, and then after age seven, that's when, you know, that information that's been um, processed, absorbed from, you know, literally as a young child in, you know, up to seven, that's when, when we usually start to act out what we've observed. In our lives, so like I said, even like in school at a very young age, we're learned, we're, we're taught, you know, be proud of your accomplishments, be ashamed, be embarrassed, hide um, your failures, um, and that can even be uh, brought in depending on the family you were raised in, right? Some of these, some families are like, whatever happens in the home stays in the home, kind of like the what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? And so you're just taught to like be embarrassed about it, to hide it. And instead of confessing it, um, I know personally for me in my healing journey, when I first was like, this is what happened, this, that, you know, being able to confess out loud, even to no one was like what broke things for me and which was, and that's what was able to help me begin to heal further. So um, it's okay if you make a mistake, you know, um, you don't have to be afraid to tell God about it. You don't have to be afraid to talk to him because he's not surprised by it. He's being that he's all knowing. And here's something else that I wanted to share. Um, God is not in time like we are. So we live in the present. Our past is, you know, the past yesterday, 20 years ago, whatever. And our future is the future, right? Um, tomorrow, 40 years from now, whatever it's going to be. But we really only function and all we really have is the present moment, but God is outside of time, right? So he, if, if you're eternal, that means that he's like in our past, our present, and our future all at the same time. And don't ask me how to explain it because uh, I haven't figured out a metaphor and analogy to explain that. But what I am saying is that before whatever mistake it is that you're afraid of and you think, I can't apologize, it's too big to, um, and, and you know, there's like no way I will be forgiven, Know that before you made that, God knew that you were going to do it. And he still allowed you and still created you. He, he still brought you into this world. You were still, you know, birthed into the world by your mother, um, your father, right? They, you know, that even if you don't speak to your mother or your father anymore for whatever reason, right? That was the channel that brought you into this world, right? And so God knew that you were going to do whatever horrible thing it was. It could be murdering someone. It, it could be like a really, really big mistake, right? But God knew that you were going to do it even before you did it. And even before you did it, he knew like even back, back <laughs> like thousands of years ago when he asked his son and said, look, these humans, they're a mess. Um, we need to step in and help them. Here's the plan. You're going to hang out on earth, live, work for 33 years. Um, we don't know a lot about what Jesus did during his childhood, um, but, or teenage years or even 20s. But I will say this, I was talking to someone else um, about a month ago, and 
Uh, it says that Jesus grew up in Nazareth, right? And it says in the Bible that no good thing comes from Nazareth. So that means that he probably came from like what we might consider to be the projects. So, you know, he, he had a life. He probably saw a lot of things. He probably heard a lot of things that would be, you know, traumatic. So what I'm saying is that, um, you know, he's, he's like been there. He's been through it. Um, and it's not like anyone's, you know, it's not like Jesus and God are like waiting to, you know, like beat you up. I can't believe you like you did this. I can't, if you start, like, if you ask God to forgive you and then it keeps coming up over and over and over again, and you keep feeling guilty, you, um, keep feeling like I'm not good enough. Like I, but I did this, I did that. That's not God. That's not the Holy spirit. That's like, um, something demonic. That's, that's, that's from the dark kingdom of darkness. Um, God will not continually be after you, after you repent and you're like, I, I was wrong. Can we work to like figure this out so I can, you know, move forward? Um, you know, the thing is, is that God is going to forgive you and then he's going to help you to move forward with and whatever those steps are is going to be for you right because <laughs> we all have different things that we need to work through that we need to transform and heal from um so yeah i wanted to say that before i went on hold on let me grab a drink um the um so yeah i just wanted to touch on that before i went on to the third thing which was <clears throat> i'm talking a lot so now i'm losing my voice um, a lot of times people will say, um, but the only way to get to paradise, to heaven, to have a good, safe, eternal life is if I believe in Jesus and I repent of my sins. That's so narrow. So I want you to think about it and I challenge you to think about it, not as narrow, but as very, very specific. So imagine I invite you over to dinner. And I say, yeah, I'm cooking. I'm having some friends over, um, you know, some people who are really special to me. So I'm inviting them over for dinner. Um, come to my house. I live in Brooklyn. And you're like, well, where are you? And I'm like, ah, you're intelligent. You can figure it out. And you think to yourself and you're like, yeah, I am intelligent. My IQ is like 110. I'm a genius. Yeah, I can figure this out. So you call me up about an hour later and you say, I'm here and I open my door and I look around and I'm like, where are you? I don't see you. And you're like, but I'm here. I'm like, I don't see you. What did you do? How did, how did you figure out how to get here? You're like, well, I took MC cubed times the circumference of Brooklyn, uh, divided that by a thousand because that seemed like a good idea. And I'm here. And I'm like, but you're not. <laughs> But dinner's going to be in 10 minutes, so I know you'll be able to make it over soon. Come on over. And you're like, well, Beth, I mean, what, what road do I take? Do I take Flatbush Ave? Do I take um, Utica Ave? Do I take the Bell Parkway? Do I take 95? Like, how do I get to your house? I'm like, oh, figure it out. Anyway, any road you take, any of the streets, all streets in Brooklyn <laughs> lead to my home. So, you know, I'll see you in 10 minutes. Uh, that's, that's, that's when dinner is going to be ready. So you call me back in 10 minutes and you're like, I'm here. And I open my door and I'm looking for you. I'm like, I don't see you. You're not on my porch. Did you park down the street? Um, no, I'm on your step. I'm on your front. I'm at your front door. I don't see you. What did you do? Well, <laughs> I took the radius <laughs> of the whole city of man, uh, whole city, all five boroughs of New York. And I divided that by five. And then I multiplied that. And you like just came up with your own formula on how to get to my house. Did you get to my house? No, you did not get to my house. You might start wondering, do I, does Beth really want me to come over and have dinner with her? Well, I might maybe Maybe I don't want you to come over and have dinner. And maybe that's why I just was like, uh, yeah, come on over. I live in Brooklyn. All roads lead to my house. And that's pretty much like God. So God, if, because, if, if God didn't really care about us spending eternity in paradise with him, in heaven with him, he would just be like, yeah, I'll see you. I'll see you in 80 years. I'll see you in 60 years, uh, 103 years. I'll see you. Uh, have fun down there and I'll see you at the end. <laughs> and we're like, but I don't know how to get there. 
Like, how do I get... How do I get to God? Like, how do I find him up there? Well, that's the thing. He gave very specific directions. So if you follow the very, very specific directions, which is, you know, believing that Jesus is the son of God, believing that he died for us to forgive us, that his blood covers our sins and that with him, when we choose to, you know, um, accept that forgiveness, then, uh, we will be able to find God, right? And spend paradise, spend eternity in paradise in heaven with him, right? It's pretty specific. Like I said, it could be considered narrow um, as like there's only one way to do it. But think of it as very specific. You're not going to be lost. It's like a very specific GPS, right? Like imagine if you were just driving somewhere and your GPS was like, turn right, turn right, turn right. And you're like, like... There's three possible choices that I could choose to turn right. Which street do I turn down? Like, where do I go? Um, He doesn't want us to get lost. If you love someone and you really want someone to come over and hang out in your house, you're going to give them very, very specific instructions. You're not going to just have them all over the place. And so that's really what it is. It's God saying, do it this way. I'm going to be very, very specific about it. But if you follow these very specific instructions, you'll get to your destination, which is peace. Who does not want peace, right? We all want peace. Rest, right? Who doesn't want rest? Joy? Who doesn't want joy, right? So if you follow this, this, and this, you get these things, right? If you don't, the chances of getting peace, joy, and um, love even are kind of not so great. Um, now, there's actually, there's one other thing. I think I have time before the live is going to end um, that I wanted to touch on. And you might be like, well, this is all great, Beth. Sounds really awesome. But, um, you know, I did try the whole Jesus thing. I did try the whole God. And I tried the whole church thing. And it just... I was appalled, right? The pastor was cheating on his wife, cheating on the taxes. All the people in the congregation, half of them were divorced. The other half were like in abusive relationships. Um, Like something's messed up. This clearly is not the place to be. Uh, And so I would say, yes, this is true. Um, Sadly, uh, there is a lot of craziness that does happen in our churches that happens Um, among Christians, you know, racism is sadly very much active in church culture, in different church cultures, um, depending on where you go, you know, among Christians, um, divorce, infidelity, you know, there's, you know, a lot of that that does happen. You know, I, my understanding is the divorce rate for Christians is about the same, if not more than, um, non-Christians. So, there is, it, it, like, I, you, you're not wrong to say, like, that's great, it sounds nice, but I don't really want any part of that. Well, here's the thing. Um, it does say that we are to be transformed um, by the renewing of our minds. And sadly, a lot of people, here's the thing, um, a lot of people um, will be like, I want to go to paradise I want to be in heaven. I want the peace. I want the joy. I want the rest. I want the love. So I'm going to um, choose to believe in Jesus and ask for my sins to be forgiven. And I'm just going to, you know, get my security, my insurance deposit. But they're not working on transforming their minds. They're not actually working on the traumas that they have, uh, you know, accumulated since, you know, young children. Um, they are not transforming themselves. So my advice, my personal advice is focus on you. Focus on your own transformation, your own healing. Focus on, you know, the things that you feel in your life need to be worked on. The things that you feel in your life aren't, you know, where you'd like them to be. Focus on your relationship with God. Focus on all those things. And the thing is, is that when you are, you know, in the process of healing and you are actually transforming your life. The thing is, you might be the person, we all have a purpose and a plan for our lives. You might be the person who ends up having to go out and work with 
those people to help them, those people who say, for example, are, you know, racist, to help them to change their, you know, thinking and, you know, eliminate that ideology from their mindset, right? Uh, if you had asked me before September 2020, if I was going to be, you know, uh, helping people with a lifestyle forgiveness, helping people go through the process of forgiveness, forgiving themselves. And a lot of times, really, to be honest, being able to accept God's forgiveness comes because we can't even forgive ourselves. So self-forgiveness, learning how to forgive ourselves is so important because it does help us to be able to wrap our brain around someone else forgiving us or wrap our brain around being able to forgive someone else. Because if we are beating ourselves up, how we treat ourselves is how we're going to treat others, right? So we're also going to be harsh and hard and angry towards other people when we're harsh and hard and angry towards ourselves. So really, honestly, a lot of this work right, that I have been trying to do with people is help people with this self-love, self-forgiveness, self-care, right? Because it does start with us. And if you had asked me before September 2020 if I would be doing this, I would have been like, no, no way. So this is what I'm saying. When, when you begin your healing process, when you begin your transformation, you may be asked to go out you know, like I felt like God was asking me, okay, so now you have this knowledge. It's not just for you. It's to help other people. You might be asked to take your knowledge and take it out to help other people who are healing from whatever pain it is, racism, abuse, divorce, like those things, those really ugly things that sadly are really um, still part of Christians' lives, right? Right. You might be the one whose purpose is to go out and help them. So, um, like I said, my my point is, yes, there's like a whole lot of mess that that is out there in our churches and everything. Don't let it stop you. Don't let it um, deter you from uh, your own personal relationship and developing a friendship with God. Um, you know, those other people are in their own place and take care of yourself first. It's kind of like, um, you know, a lot of times I hear people use the analogy, if you're on an airplane and the plane's going down or loses air pressure or whatever, put on your own air mask, oxygen mask before you help the person next to you. Even if that person is a small child, help yourself first. So take care of yourself, your healing, whatever it is that you're struggling with, whatever it is you're hurting with, take care of yourself first and your relationship with God. And then it may be that you use your knowledge to go help others, you know, transform their lives and live differently. So, um, oh, there's one other thing. Yeah, I have a whole list of notes. It's like all over the place. There's one other thing. The other thing that a lot of times people are like, oh, yes, I decided that, you know, I would choose Jesus. I would, you know, try to follow God's commandments and whatever, but it's not really working out. Um, well, here's the thing. God, um, sadly, another sad thing is, um, especially in American culture, a lot of times it's like God is treated as like prosperity, like he's an ATM machine and he's not an ATM machine. Yes, he's our protector. Yes, he's our provider. So many things. But in America, we think, oh, yes, so uh, if I'm a disciple of Jesus, I'm a fi- if I'm a follower of Jesus, that must mean my bank account's going to be in the millions. That must mean I'm going to get the rolls. That must mean I'm going to get the mansion. That means I'm going to have the jet set life. Um, it could. And I'm not saying that it wouldn't. But if you go outside of America, so for example, um, when I travel outside of the U.S. and I go places and I see... Um, for example, uh, Muslim uh, background, Christians who are have a Muslim background, right? They left um, their faith as Muslims and converted. They chose um, to become a disciple of Jesus, right? Those people are not living the prosperous life. They might be literally um, brought in. I, you know, I met someone on one of my travels. And he was going to be brought in the next week for questioning by the police, basically only simply because he believed in Jesus, right? Um, This is something that is like kind of ignored and we think, you know, we're just going to have this like perfect cushy life, but not necessarily. So he was going to be brought in for questioning and questioning means like you're going to kind of get beat to try to get information out of you. Um, 
you know, his children had been stones. People had thrown stones at his children just because of what he believed, not even what because of what the children believed, but because of his beliefs. So um, sometimes when we do uh, choose to be forgiven, when we choose forgiveness for ourselves, when we choose Jesus for ourselves, when we choose to forgive others, um, that does not always mean that we're going to have a picture perfect, pretty, happy life. And if you even study um, like the disciples, the people who were closest to Jesus, like the original, minus Judas, <laughs> so the original 11, they all, except for one, it might have been John, I, don't quote me, um, they all died horrible, horrible deaths, right? They ended up sacrificing their lives to um, because of their beliefs and because they were sharing um, their beliefs with others, right? My favorite one, Peter, because he was like so feisty, <laughs> kind of like me, and he was just like always impulsive and jumping into things and like, yeah, I'm ready to go, uh, <laughs> getting himself in trouble. But um, he was crucified upside down. That, that's how he went. Um, so what I'm saying is, yes, Jesus does say that I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. There's the promise, um, that we will be provided for, although there are certain things, um, that we might have to do. So for example, there are commandments that giving to the poor is what will bring us, um, you know, financial blessings. So there are certain things that we even have to do and learn to activate those blessings, um, but what I'm trying to say is that it does not always mean automatically it's going to be a cushy, easy life. And I think that that has over time discouraged a lot of people and people are like, well, I tried the whole God thing, but it was really hard. You know, like I had to give up friends. I had to, and you know, I, I had people laugh at me. I had, you know, I, I, I was discriminated against. But the thing is the the people that, um, the men that I met when I was on this one trip um, who were being like seriously persecuted, um, you know, literally beat, literally, um, you know, just ostracized from society, not able to get a job um, because they believed in Jesus. And so they were like, nope, no one will hire me. I can't get hired. I can't get a job, right? So even in all of that situation, those hard situations, they were still like, but I don't regret it. I would choose what I chose. I would choose Jesus all over again. I would still choose the same thing. Um, so that must mean that even if you're being beat, you're being brought in for questioning, your family's being discriminated against, you're being discriminated against, it must mean that on some level, there's something that is far superior to anything that we could get or they could get specifically from, from other people or from the world or from their society, right? So... Um, so yes, uh, that was pretty much what I wanted to share on today, uh, because like I said at the beginning, uh, it is a historic date for Christians, not, the, sorry, not date, day, because <laughs> it was not necessarily, I don't know what day it really happened, um, but the, the season, right, is, is specifically important to Christians because of you know, Jesus and forgiveness. So I did, especially since I've been doing a lot of work on forgiveness, want to just jump in, share a couple thoughts about it. <laughs> Maybe I shared a lot of thoughts. I hope you guys kept up. If you have any questions, you're always welcome to reach out to me. I am working on um, the forgiveness journal that I did um, back in February. It's going to be available on Amazon soon. So if you're interested, if you are struggling and, and you're like, but I can't forgive myself, like I have done things that are so horrible, I can't forgive myself, or I, you know, I can forgive myself, but like this other person did, like, I can't believe what they did if you knew what they did to me, right? So if you're like really struggling with being able to receive forgiveness for yourself or give forgiveness to others, please in the comments below, like drop me or drop let me know. Um, because I am going to be, like I said, uh, putting my forgiveness journal on Amazon so that it will be available for even more people because it is really so important. Um, oh, <laughs> I forgot one other thing. So if we are going to receive forgiveness from God, there is a verse and off the top of my head, I'm, I'm bad with remembering like numbers, but anyway, it does say that if we do not forgive others, our sins will not be forgiven. Our mistakes will not be forgiven. 
So if we want to actually be able to receive forgiveness from God, keep that forgiveness, so to speak, um, keep that access that we have to um, a safe, loving, joyful, uh, peaceful, eternal life, we actually have to forgive others. Literally, our life, our life, our spiritual life, um, our emotional life, all aspects of our life, even our financial lives, like our romantic lives, our professional lives, every single aspect of our life here on earth and beyond literally is dependent on not only our ability to receive forgiveness, but our willingness and desire to forgive others. So if, if we want forgiveness, it's kind of like that, you know, uh, what is it? There's a saying like two to tangle, right? If, but that's not quite the saying I'm looking for. But if we, if, if it's good for you, it's good for me. Um, so if it's good for me, it's good for you. So if I, if, it, if forgiveness is good enough for me to be able to receive and to get, then it also ultimately has to mean that it's good enough for us to give to other people. Um, I think I just looked at my notes. I think that's like literally really all I wanted to share for today. So that's it. Like I said, reach out to me if you have any questions. My forgiveness journal is going to be available soon on Amazon. And have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful week ahead. All right. Take care. Peace. Hi, 